have Stephanie call the roll. Okay, let's see. Okay, we have uh, Margaret Larson. Present. Calling from, wait, calling from Northfield Township, Michigan. Thanks. Marie Gress. Present, calling from Milan, Michigan. Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling from Ypsilanti Township, Michigan. Steve Stein. Uh, yes, calling from Ann Arbor Township. Bennett Stark. Um, yes, calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Margaret Reynolds. No. Present, calling from Pittsfield Township. Okay, and I do not see Jason yet. Okay, you have quorum. Thank you. Um, all right, so at this point, I'm looking to see if we have anyone from the public with us. see we have two attendees. If there's anyone in the public that wishes to make a comment at this time, it's time for public participation. If you'd raise your hand, I will call on you if you wish to speak. Seeing none, we will move ahead on the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is commission response. Since we've had no public participation, we won't be doing that part. The next item on the agenda is report from the Board of Commissioners and seeing that Jason is not yet with us, unless that's Jason, no, it's not. Um, yeah, seeing that Jason is not yet with us, then we will uh, sort of put that on the side and when he shows up, we will um, call on him when it's a good time in the agenda. Uh, next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Um, do we have a motion? I will make I that motion. I'll support it. Okay, it's been moved and supported. Um, is there any discussion? <coughs> okay, Stephanie, would you call the roll, please? Yep. Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Grest? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Steve Stein? Yes. Bennett Stark? Yes. And Margaret Reynolds? Yes. Minutes pass. Okay, thank you. Um, it's now time for subcommittee updates. Uh, Marie, do you have anything for communications? Yeah, so uh, for those of you who um, missed our pre-meeting little talk, Peter updated us that he's working to get all the agendas, minutes, and videos posted to the website. Um, and then the presentations and handouts will have up by the end of August. Um, during last meeting's discussion, we talked about um, different efforts to, to get the word out there and all of, all of those things about the work that we're doing, presentations, things like that. Um, one person emailed me concerned that we were saying that the Board of Commissioners was gonna do these presentations for us. And that's, that's not the intent. We would love if they wanted to come to some of these presentations we're doing to the, com the community. Um, but there's no expectation or request for the Board of Commissioners to do that. We do, however, I want to make sure if we're doing any press releases, any social media things, any radio talk shows, that we get those things approved through whatever county process exists. I'll probably go through Peter. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, that's when we're talking about outreach, engagement, doing presentations, things like that. It's uh, we, we as a commission take ownership of that. Um, we had a request for outreach. Monica Prince from the Ypsilanti Senior Center would love if a COA member or two could come speak to their membership about the work that we're doing and um, encourage them to, to come and, and be involved. If that's something that you're interested in doing, um, let me know and I'll get you connected with Monica so you guys can find the, the schedule that works best for you. Just send me an email. Um, are there any other, I'm going to, I'm keeping record of outreach engagement efforts that have been happening. Um, so I have Lori Terrace, Bennett did that in June. Marta talked to the senior center directors in July. Have there been any new 
engagement um, outreach efforts? Uh, this is an older one, uh, but back in April, I uh, talked about um, our report um, to the state um, commission, uh, advisory commission on aging. And I promised them when materials are posted, I would share okay. that. Thank you. Bennett, did you have something? Well, yeah, I, a friend of mine expressed interest in starting a group, and this would be um, at um, Turner Senior Center. And I suggested, I said that I was interested as a citizen, as it were, but I suggested to him that he speak with Jennifer Howard. So I, I um, don't know whether this qualifies as outreach because um, my status is sort of ambiguous. Um, I um, basically, um, and Jennifer Howard is aware that I suggested to my friend that he contact uh, Jennifer Howard and not me. So would that be um, any involvement in that group? Would that be regarded as outreach by the commission and or? Um, so I'm asking for clarification, uh, Marie. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it doesn't, so nothing, you haven't actually had like a meeting to talk about the work that the COA is doing, correct? You haven't done that yet? No, absolutely not. And okay. that, um, absolutely not. Yeah. I would say, um, and feel free others to, to pop in. I would say if you were going to do a presentation on the commission or share like one-time information about the work that we're doing, um, that would be counted that would be part of this outreach and engagement efforts. If you wanted to continue going to this group, you would be continuing as an individual, not as a representative of the Commission on Aging. Does that make sense? It does, it okay. does. Um, and um, I will keep you informed. It's not right. altogether uh, impossible that I might at one point uh, say, uh, Jennifer, are you interested in a presentation? And at that point, I will contact you. By the way, is there since uh, communication and my sort of double role, um, respecting the boundaries is part of it. Is there any way that I can sort of participate in the work of your subcommittee? Yeah, um, currently we, it is Marta and myself. Um, so there is definitely room for additional people. Uh, I guess that, that raises a different question that I'll, I'll make sure to circle back later. Since our quorum has changed, does that change the amount of people that can be in our subcommittees? Um, but as far as you joining our group, yes, you're more than welcome to. Um, we meet pretty informally and pretty irregularly. Okay, um, I think it does make sense uh, given whatever, um, you know, thank you. Yeah. Great. Any other questions or discussion on communication? Seeing no hands, we'll move on to needs assessment and that's you, Marie. Yeah, so we had our monthly meeting and we just discussed the continued need for a countywide aging strategic plan. And we're still waiting on updates from the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation as they look into funding for a consultant to coordinate the process. Um, we're even more excited about this now that the County administrator has some some work on their plate to figure out funding for the aging sector, like what's been happening and all that stuff, um, and towards the millage. So um, yeah, just we're really excited about that, and that, that was pretty much our discussion. Are there any questions about that? Great. 
I do not see any hands. Okay. Um, ARPA subcommittee, Bonnie had been the chair of that uh, subcommittee. And since Bonnie has stepped down from the commission, um, the officers will take a look and see which officer is willing to participate on that subcommittee. Who will, is anybody on that subcommittee have a report, any report at all? I, I don't think they've been meeting. Yeah, we have not met since uh, ARPA was approved and we're just waiting to hear whether there would be a role for the Commission on Aging or and whether they in fact are seeking um, out one or more of us as an advisor. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, uh, potential millage. Um, we, after um, the uh, County Commission um, voted a resolution to direct the County Admissioner Administrator I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning, obviously, <laughs> um, to um, both uh, look at resources currently uh, being spent by the county uh, on behalf of older adults and also to come up with some possible ways in which a potential millage might be administered. Uh, we felt that we would not need to meet until um, that process begins to happen uh, and uh, see if uh, we can be of any assistance to county administration in that effort. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions about that? No, okay. Uh, uh, under our next agenda item is discussion items uh, A, innovative solutions discussion, and Elizabeth is going to lead that. And Elizabeth, I'm going to let you lead that and also call on anyone who raises their hand so you have the floor at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, one of the things we've talked about is um, a whole variety of innovative programs uh, that address the needs of older adults. Um, and wanted to look at what we have uh, in existence in our community. And that's one of the things the commission has been doing uh, since we started meeting is inviting various groups, service providers to come in and discuss their programming. And then as we look at what we're gonna focus on in the future, uh, my thought was something that could be helpful is have a, a relatively high level discussion of programs that we think are really innovative that as a commission, we might want to find out more about as uh, in the coming year. And as we're looking at um, different programming that uh, might, meet the needs of older adults in our community. So I asked our commissioners to um, give information uh, about various um, innovative programs they know about. The first thing I would like to um, suggest is a way in which we all can continue to find out about innovative programs. And Stephanie, would you be able to screen share the link to the End Social Isolation and Loneliness Action Forum. Yep, I'll do that right now. Thank you. This is a group, the Foundation for Social Connection, that um, is an international group, although most of its members are in the United States, of policymakers, service providers, older adults who are trying to address the issue of social isolation. They're, they're having a virtual conference on October 11th, 12th, and 13th that is free. Um, uh, Stephanie will has kindly said she would be able to send us the link to this, um, what I'm showing you now, which is the registration page. But it will be a really interesting discussion about how to deal with social isolation and own uh, loneliness for older adults. And I bring this up because that has been a real substance of 
our conversation in the past uh, year is the impact of social isolation. We discussed it in terms of COVID, but it's an ongoing issue for older adults. So one thing I would encourage the commissioners and anybody else watching is if you have the time, because it's free, you might want to see if you can hop on this forum and see if this comes up with some ideas that the commission in the future might want to look at. So thanks, Stephanie. We will look forward to your email, which will have the link in it at some point. Thank you. Then uh, Steve uh, submitted some ideas about um, things that he's aware of that have been successful and the potential to be adopted and expanded in our county. So I'd like to turn over the next part of our discussion to Steve to share his programs he's identified. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, the program that um, I thought would be worth mentioning is a program that was a collaborative um, but prior to COVID, but continued through COVID um, that we called Whatever It Takes. And it was really a collaboration between uh, Trinity, um, St. Joe's Hospital, ER Group, the uh, EPMG is called uh, IHA, which is a large practice um, both primary care and specialists that are um, within Washington County. Um, the main really focus is Yarn Valley Ambulance. And then we also included our Trinity's Home Care Agency, St. Joe's Home Care Agency, and also Glacier Hills. Um, and, and the program really was, came out of uh, real concern about how Medicare pays. And so it winds up that when a patient calls 911, a Medicare patient calls 911, the only way that an ambulance gets paid is if they transport that older adult to the ER. So you can imagine that all across the country, what happens is that if somebody calls 911, generally that person goes to the ER. And, and really what HVA shared was that over 50% of their calls through 911 are actually non-emergency calls. They don't, they, they transport the person, but they don't put the lights on, they don't put the siren on because it's, a, it's really a, you know, a non-emergent type situation. And so this program was really had a goal of sort of um, turning that around and also to be very much an uh, older adult patient-centered program. Um, and this is how it works. So first of all, I want to thank um, the funding sources, right, which, you know, we'll hear about. There's some good news on that. But we received a million dollars from Michigan Health Endowment Fund, initially for the Medicare population. And then because of its success, we actually received money to serve the Medicaid population and the underinsured um, population as well. Um, Trinity also kicked in around a quarter million dollars. Um, and the Ann Arbor Community Foundation actually was very helpful through the Glacier Hills Legacy um, Fund to support some of the important things that were beneficial, which was uh, a small video that allowed us to communicate the issues to different, uh, different providers. So here's how it worked. Um, Basically, what we did was we expanded the program to not only when somebody called 911, but that if a patient, <clears throat> excuse me, if a patient or an older adult called their doctor, so an IHA primary care physician or specialist, and they were concerned about the person, but didn't feel either comfortable bringing them in right away or didn't have any slots, um, but they felt it was urgent. Rather than say, hey, go to the ER, what they had the ability to do was to call Yarn Valley Ambulance and say, hey, listen, we're really concerned about this person. They, they speak about the short of breath or they speak about they have a low grade fever or whatever the issue is, could you go in and check? Um, um, and then a home, our home care agency could have could do the same thing. Um, if a nurse goes out there or they get a call and they need something that seems somewhat urgent, 
So it's not like, oh, they have a cold, but they need urgent, they need someone with eyes on it. And it may be an emergency, but very likely not um, need for a transport. Um, and then Glacier Hills, again, had the same opportunity. So instead of calling 911, they could call. Now, why is that important? What's important is that as opposed to leading to a transfer, they could treat the person in place. So the dollars that we got in this funding allowed for the ambulance to basically set up a visit with the patient's doctor, which would be best, but if the doctor was unavailable, they'd be able to work with the ER physician and have either a telephone visit or a virtual visit um, through telehealth. Um, a thing I'll mention is before COVID, a telehealth visit was not paid for. So also some of the funding went to pay for the doctor who did the telehealth visit and a reduced fee if it was just a phone visit. So what would happen is the, you know, the, the community paramedic would do an assessment. They call the doc or have a video with the doc. The doc would actually order testing um, so they can do an oxygen saturation to check the oxygen right in the home. They could do an EKG. They could do stat labs where they actually get the lab test done right on site immediately. So they could check a sugar, they could check a sodium, all of those types of things right there on site. And we also had an arrangement with a mobile expert company that would come in very quickly and the results, because it's digital, could be read immediately by St. Joe's radiologists. So all of that gets done, and now the doctor has enough information to actually um, determine what treatment they need. So Urine Valley Ambulance um, paramedics would treat the person with heart failure with intravenous Lasix, or maybe someone's dehydrated, and they would treat them with um, fluids. Or if someone had a, uh, an infection that didn't need hospitalization, they treat them with either IV antibiotics and then arrange for them to get oral antibiotics, you know, and follow. They could treat them with asthma, with inhaler treatment, all of those things right on site. And of course, very conservatively, if there was any concern about um, future risk, they would transport the person. So it wasn't like instead of, we always, the, the do no harm rule was always number one. So things like chest pain, always got transferred, you know, so anything that was concerning. But it wound up that over 60% of the, I think it was 66% of the people that were seen by Urine Valley Ambulance, whether it was a 911 call or got um, sent by one of, or, or was referred by one of these um, clinical providers, two out of three people were able to stay in the home and um, with, uh, safely. Um, the other thing I'll mention that I thought was really one of the most important things is the follow-up. So um, all of the information, first of all, was communicated to the primary care doc. So whenever an HVA provider did anything, let's say they were working with the ER doc, their note would get to the primary care doc, or even if they spoke to the primary care doc, they would get the note. So if the person had a follow-up visit, same day, next day, or even a week later, that doc had the latest information of what, what happened in it. The second thing was what we called see something, do something, which allowed for um, the community paramedic to assess in some ways the home and the situation so that if there was a need for follow-up, they would communicate with the social service agencies. Many times it was Jewish family services, but if they need other type of services. And that wound up really important because as you know, if let's say somebody's in the home with asthma and they have roaches in the house, and you could wind up hospitalizing them and then you send them back to the roaches, they're just gonna come back. So, you know, if you pe send people back to the same situation, you often have the same result. So that was a really, a, you know, important piece of this well. Um, finishing up, because I know I'm probably out of time. Um, I just wanna mention regards to funding. So the program is actually still going on. One of the exciting things during COVID was HVA was able to deliver. Now I was told just the other day, 2000 doses of monoclonal antibodies for older adults who were um, in the home with a COVID diagnosis as a way of reducing the risk of COVID um, for hospitalization and death. And, and that's, that's amazing. I mean, it actually got, got written up in journals 
uh, General American Medical Association because of its impact. Um, it also was measured by um, what's called an ACL, Accountable Care Organization, which is a Medicare fee-for-service program, and was able to show the return on, on um, investment, so to speak. So not only did it reduce hospitalization, ER visits, but was able to show the savings associated, as you can imagine, with a hospitalization being 10,000, 15,000, it doesn't take a lot of saved hospitalizations and ER visits for this to be really cost effective. And then finally, what I'll mention for now is that there was a demonstration um, program by Medicare that started around a year ago, maybe two years ago, and Michigan and um, Trinity got together with HVA and applied for. And now if somebody calls 911, Medicare, this is a demonstration, there's 100, only 100 ambulance companies in the whole country, um, Urine Valley Ambulance is one of them. Medicare will cover it if it's a 911 call, they will cover for that type of visit. So they can deliver the care on site, they'll pay the, tele, the physician, they'll pay the ambulance, and um, they even can transfer somebody to their doctor's office or to urgent care and still get paid. So that program is a five-year program demonstration that's going on now, but it's only through the 911 system. So they are actively seeking out funding for the non-911 because in the long run, you know, why go through the 911 system when a doc or a, a home care agency or a nursing home could just call directly and not go through all of the regulations and issues related to that. So that's where it stands right now um, and, and sort of, be ready to take questions if I wasn't clear on anything. Steve? Yes. I, I would just add something. Um, you Please. know, I um, I'm, um, actually had a friend in Glacier Hills who had previously had several instances of what was chest pain to her and uh, time she would get this chest pain they'd send her to the ER and run her through a myriad of tests at great expense and and really devastating to her and um when this program came into effect uh they started treating reflux instead of sending her to the hospital her heart was a strong i mean she had so much workup on her heart so um, they had kind of a, um, a conference and, and I was able to convince them they shouldn't send her to the hospital, but try this. And um, gosh, what a relief it was for her. From a patient perspective, this is a wonderful program and um, obviously cost effective in her situation as well and very safe. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And and I would say that we did satisfaction surveys and as you can imagine, not only um, patient satisfaction, but family satisfaction, you know, not having to rush to the ER and three in the morning, the trauma, yeah. you know, associated, especially people with dementia. Um, and so the families, and then I'd say the providers were really, really excited about it because they, yeah. they had this other arm that they can use instead of the traditional, if you feel this is an emergency called go to the ER, but they actually had this other piece. So um, I'm hoping that there'll be opportunities for funding that this could happen, not only in Washington County, but even more so around the country. Yeah, it's a great program. Thank you, Mark. I have a couple of questions myself also, um, Steve. Um, is this available through 911? So if someone calls 911, that get kicks get kicks into the community paramedic, or do they have to call and ask for community paramedic? No. So um, the first of all, in regards to that, whatever it takes program, which they say they still have some funding for, so it's still active. That one doesn't even have to be in the 911 call, but it's just not in the CMS demonstration where Medicaid, Medicare directly pays. But let's go with the, it's called ET3, emergency transfer to whatever, you know, this demonstration program. They would call 911. The dispatch person who takes the call kind of triages the call. And they say, is this somebody who needs 
um, a community paramedic that likely could stay in the community? Or is this someone that truly has, you know, their blood pressure drop, they have chest pain, this is something serious. And then it goes that route. And even if the community paramedic winds up going, they then triage it again. And they may say, you know what, this is not something we could treat in the home. We got to get them right to, um, you know, to the ER. So no, they don't, they, they don't even have the realistically the ability as a patient to make that determination. It's really triaged by clinicians. Mm -hmm. And is it only IAHA patients or is it? No, oh, so this, that's a great question. So this um, EC3, this new program, is for every Medicare patient under 65, over 65, and University of Michigan and Trinity were both involved in the application with your Valley Ambulance. Perfect. And, and community agencies as well, I'll mention. I see that Bennett also has a question. Um, well, this couldn't be more important. Uh, every day at Lurie Terrace, it seems that the an ambulance is, you know, in front of uh, Lurie Terrace. And in most instances, it seems to me that when uh, the folks, uh, when the ambulance folks are uh, leaving, there is, uh, they have a stretcher in which no one is in. So it would <laughs> seem to be an indicator uh, that this is a significant cost saving measure. Again, it is an everyday occurrence when you have 120 units and, um, and then you see an ambulance with uh, rather a stretcher. So this is a proposal is at this point, Stephen, or is no, it- No, no, this place? has been going on. Um, so the initial demonstration, the, the initial program has actually gone on for many, many years. We received funding probably in like seven, 2017, 18. So it's been going on even in this newer, whatever it takes form since then. Um, and then we got some funding. I, I will mention Blue Cross Blue Shield saw the results and they started paying for it. So some of the insurance companies started paying for it. And the demonstration from Medicare for the 911 piece of this started, I believe, in 2020. So that program, the Medicare program that specifically, if you call 911, that's in existence. It's a five year program, which HVA and the docs will get paid for their, their stay. So it's active. Right okay, now. well, far out, um, yeah. as we used to say, far <laughs> out. <laughs> we still say it every once in a while. Yeah. And Stephen, do you have anything in writing that you could distribute to the commission on this? Yes. Um, Stephanie, I believe, has a couple of documents, one that described the original pilot that I think talks about the four pillars. I, I wrote that up for some national uh, organization. And then the other thing she has is what I'll call an infographic that describes the CMS, the Medicare program that's in existence, you know, now when you call 911, right? I think you have that, right, Stephanie, that we could send out? Yep, I have those two documents. I can send them out after along with what um, Elizabeth talked about. Okay. Yeah, and I, I just mentioned the whatever it takes document was really wrote about our pilot, like to, to proof of concept. And, and it expanded that, again, as I mentioned, to all Medicare people in Washtenaw County and all um, Medicaid and underinsured in, in Washtenaw County. Um, and then eventually Blue Cross Blue Shield as well. Great. Thank you. And, I, and by the way, I'm sure someone from the Huron Valley Ambulance would be more than happy to give you details um, if that was of interest to the group. And, and I have to say the gratification I had in listening to the community paramedics talk about the stories like Margie had mentioned, it, they're just a really impressive group. They have added training, so it's not just a paramedic. They go for an extra year, so they have a lot of knowledge about social, research, you know, social service resources in the community. They have a lot of interpersonal sort of training to engage and it's it, they're just an amazing group that uh, you know I have to say I think we'll see a few tears if they tell some of the stories that I heard
I think if you talk to them, um, I've, I've heard this. I, I haven't talked to them myself, but they really love that job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, there's a video, by the way. Stephanie can send you a video that thanks to the Ann Arbor Community Foundation and the Glacier Hill Legacy Fund um, about the program. It's like five minutes. And maybe, Stephanie, you could send out that that link. Can you send that to me? Because I don't have the link to that. I yet. will send that to you. Okay, great. Yeah. And then I will send it out. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, no problem. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. This is two key points. I draw from this that is a theme as our discussions have been throughout the year, which is people want to stay in their homes. And this allows people to receive services to help them stay in their homes uh, without having to, to be transported to the ER and then maybe things escalate. Um, the other theme is providing services where people are touched by a provider. In this case, people will call 911 or they might have their home health care provider or they're in a residence like in Glacier Hills or something like that. And so that's another theme I see going on is figuring out ways where people can um, get what they need without having to go on their own personal search for it, but they get connected already by being touched by somebody providing a service to them. And what I'd like to talk about has those two themes too, staying in a home and also the touch by somebody they're already linked with. And that's the CAPABLE program, Community Aging in Place, Advancing Better Living for Elders. I, and this is a program that's been around for a while nationwide. It was started by John Hopkins. It's been provided throughout the state. And we in Washtenaw County have the biggest experience with it because Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels has participated in uh, a project doing it. And the point is, as we know, most older adults want to stay in their homes, but they may have challenges. And a lot of that may be related to daily living activities, bathing, dressing, getting in and out of a chair. If you can't do those daily living activities yourself, you're not going to be able to stay in the home. So this model provides five months of in-home support through an occupational therapist, a registered nurse, and a handy worker, somebody who can do repairs and modifications. And also, Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels demonstration added the services of their social worker. So you work with the older adult to set a goal, what it'll take to be able to stay safely in the home, and work to achieve the goals. And so that interdisciplinary team helps use motivational interviewing, coaching. It's been used throughout the country, as I said. The state of Michigan started a demonstration project in 2019-21. And Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels, in partnership with Habitat for Humanity to help provide some of those home modification services got a foundation grant from the Wilson Foundation to try it. And working with, they're focusing on somebody's function rather than their disease and a real focus on fall prevention because one of the things we know that uh, the research shows one in four older adults experiences a fall that can significantly impact their life. So some of the feedback is, that's new about this is it's working with the occupational therapy profession, which sometimes we forget in our group of professionals is helping people take care in the environment where the occupation happens. 
So a lot of occupational therapy now takes place in skilled nursing homes or rehab facilities after a fall. And it's really hard. And I can say from personal experience, having had knee replacements, um, having had significant back surgery, that the little place where you do occupational ther therapy in the rehab facility is nothing like my house. And it is hard to go, oh, this is how I figure out how I'm going to cook dinner in my house. So a big point of this is this is in somebody's home before an incident happens. And there's a lot of show me about it. Also, um, the social workers in Meals on Wheels have been, a, because it's already a trusted resource, people are used to Meals on Wheels and they trust them to help them link to other service providers, helping address lack of transportation, medical access, as Steve pointed out, that can be such an issue. So it becomes a really warm handoff. And then there's that specific physical component um, that allows um, Habitat for Humanity staff or in other place, other kinds of handy. Oh, one, one, one party Taylor. To look at um, what somebody needs and often these can be pretty simple home modifications that can be done to keep somebody in the home. We tend to think of only ramps sometimes and wheelchair access. And there's a whole range of things that can be done to make life safer. So that's just a really broad overview. I know folks from both the uh, state government dealing with capable, and I'm sure uh, Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels would be happy to provide some more information. Um, I haven't been able to connect yet with Allison Townsend to get uh, any material, um, written material about it that they would like to share. I just have the draft report. I want to make sure before I send it to Stephanie to send out to you that that's in the final format that they want shared but I will do that. So that's a really broad brush overview, but it's an intervention where occupational therapist, social worker, and handy person work with somebody to develop a plan. What do I need to be able to stay safely in my home to implement it? There's that occupational therapy training aspect to it. There's the warm handoff to other service providers who um, may will be able to help with other services. And it really builds on, in this, our example in Washtenaw County, Meals on Wheels already has that connection with an adult. So they're able to help identify folks who might benefit from the program. Any questions? Yeah, Dina. You probably know a lot more about this program than I do. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know about all of them, actually. <laughs> um, I just kind of want to make a comment. I guess I don't have a question. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things from the social service side that we see is, is a real challenge is that these these innovative models uh, tend to uh, tend to tend to focus kind of more on the, the healthcare side of, of, of the needs. And there, you know, often is more funding available, you know, on the healthcare side, but what, you know, where the real gaps are, are who's paying for those social services, who's paying for the home modifications, who's paying for the transportation. And, and that, you know, really is a big challenge for nonprofit organizations. Um, because even, you know, these, you know, innovative models, you know, you still have to have, you know, somebody who's paying for even the ability to coordinate these services, mm -hmm. you know, help an older adult navigate uh, all of the, the social services that are out there. So, 
you know, there are there are um, models that are developing across the country that are intended to kind of integrate more between healthcare and social care, and and that they're being sort of built up as this is a one system and we need payment models that cover this whole system, not just one side or the other. And, and there are um, there are some successful programs across the country who are getting reimbursement from health plans for a, for all of those services, you know, including those, those social service delivery, uh, the delivery care. I think that's unquestionably a point that our commission needs to consider as we discuss issues in the future is not only identifying, gee, this is such a great program. I was about to say cool, Bennett, showing my age. <laughs> but um, we need to think about how in Washtenaw County things can be implemented on an ongoing basis. Yeah, Margaret. Well, a couple of things occur to me. One, one is, and I'm, I'm not sure this is true, but <clears throat> when we talk about um, the domains of, um, that, that everyone's dealing with in the um, aging sector, when we talk about innovative programs, it seems like the overriding theme is to keep people in their homes. It seems that that covers almost everything. And should that be, should that be a, the overriding theme? Just asking. And the, the other thing kind of to follow up on, um, Dina, the, I, I work with the Glacier Hills Legacy Fund. And one of the things, as, as we've talked about, one of the most difficult things is uh, sustainability. And it, it's just a constant struggle for um, social service agencies and those who are funding to figure out how this is sustainable. And I think the, you know, obviously um, it's going to reduce healthcare costs and long-term care costs if we can keep people in their homes. And the case needs to be made for funding, as you've said, you know. You know. Thanks. Um, and related to that, um, I know many states uh, have really focused on the funding uh, of those specific home maintenance things. I just am looking right now at an article about um, a local housing authority in Maine uh, that started a program to fund adult home modifications. And most housing authorities now in Maine have adopted that. And again, it's the issue of providing the access to the service and the funding for the service. Uh, I saw Bennett's hand and then Steve. Okay, well, I just want to uh, repeat uh, what I believe uh, Margaret said uh, that um, it is not in all size, fit, um, let me, the decision uh, of moving into a, um, an apartment complex um, is uh, whether or not is actually a complex decision. And uh, there are a number of factors uh, in every, I wouldn't um, sort of encourage someone who, uh, just as a matter of fact, believes necessarily it would be um, much better either to remain in the uh, home that he or she is living in or moving in to a senior community. There are pluses and minuses in both cases. So um, I just want to repeat that thought that Margaret made. Thank you. And I know that we've uh, heard that whole issue about housing and the range of housing resources 
uh, in prior meetings, and that's clearly a, a very important consideration is providing a range of options. Steve. Yeah, no, I, I think one topic is that it was pointing out is the whole concept of supportive housing. And we do have some here in uh, Washington County, but there are a lot of, for example, HUD housing that do not have those benefits. And so the idea that somebody could continue to live in their apartment and be able to get, you know, um, home health, no, well, not home health aid, but personal care services, or as, you know, you had the capable so that people can stay in their home. Um, and also to think about the socialization piece as well, to have activities there. So it's not only we're, you know, allowing them to physically stay in their home, but they actually, their world is bigger through technology and through those kinds of things. So yeah, I agree, Bennett, with that and, and Margie's. I um, also want to mention nursing home residents, that there's a significant number of people that are in the long stay part of nursing homes that are only there because there weren't the resources to keep them in the community. And that if we're really being sort of holistic in our thinking and compassionate in our thinking, that if you assess that population and we're able to give them um, you know, supportive housing, many of those also may well not be um, may well be able to be in the community should they desire to to do so um, and then my final question Elizabeth this is for you I, um, you know that this was kind of a informational session where we talked about in but you have um, what's your thoughts about where do we go from here in regards to how the Commission on Aging and maybe the Board of Commissioners can have an impact to bring more innovation to Washington County well, I'm going to put that on hold for just a second, Steve, because you were, and thank you so much for submitting your innovative ideas. I wonder if this discussion has triggered thoughts by any of our other commission members about a program or something that they think we should explore in the future. Hearing nothing specific, uh, um, my thinking is, Steve, to answer your question, is that these might be programs to consider as agenda items uh, if the group wishes to uh, have a little more exploration on as and consider these as part of our discussions as we develop our plan for uh, moving forward and our next tasks in the commission. So with that, Marta, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I'm really not sure where we should go from here. So I'm, I'm, I don't really have an answer. I do think it's a good idea to maybe invite a longer presentation about the HVA community paramedics and maybe to invite a longer presentation about the CAPABLE program um, just to sort of get those on the record in a recorded meeting uh, for with a representative from those programs. I think that might be a, an interesting way to go. Um, but I think also, I think it would be good for each of us to sort of hunt around and see if we can find any other examples of things that work in other places, not necessarily here. For example, I know that the Healthy Aging Collaborative is really doing a deep dive into transportation. And that's, that's some of the things they're looking at over the summer, if I'm correct. Um, and so hopefully they will have at a point uh, some materials to share with us that really address some of the transportation issues. And I know they're also really uh, trying to look at not just you know the Adam Millage past, which that's great, but a lot of the county is not served by ADA. Um, yeah, I had a friend from Sio Township going, well, I didn't see any millage to uh, vote on. And I'm going, that's because Sio Township doesn't participate <laughs> in ADA. So um, I think that's gonna be very helpful for that whole domain of transportation uh, too. I see Dean's hand and then Steven. So I thought, I'm wondering if uh, as part of the kind of sort of future 
decision making around the older adult priority fund, if uh, there it may be a benefit to have some criteria that may not be the right word, but some kind of criteria around, you know, innovative solutions or sustainability uh, mm -hmm. that is part of that decision making process on, you know, how you distribute those funds. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good idea, and um, I'm not sure, and we'll be hearing from Jason next, so maybe we'll find out how the Board of Commissioners intends to address that so that we can figure out whether someone from this commission will be able to be part of the process for figuring out this criteria for awarding those funds. Uh, Stephen, you had your hand up? Yeah, I mean, it's actually very related to what Dina was saying, is that there might be an opportunity for the Commission on Aging to um, since they haven't really decided whether we have a role, what our role would be for the opera fund, but that doesn't mean no matter what the role that we can't sort of make a recommendation if we learn about a program that we feel good about to say, hey, you know what, this is something we think you should look at. And no, we don't make the decision. Um, the other thing I think we have an opportunity to do since we don't really control the funding and the Commission on Aging has, has those dollars, that if we see a program, we might go to Jason and Peter and say, hey, you know, we think it's really important that the Board of Commission, the Washington County Commissioners are aware of this program. And it could be a martyr like you or someone introduces them. And that's part of what we do for the, the county commissioners is we introduce these types of programs. So they're educated about it and potentially starting to think about funding to support it if there's a need for funding. Um, and that could be part of your regular presentation is bringing innovation ideas to it. And, and that could be part of our role. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Marie? Yeah, I love the idea of bringing up some of these innovative solutions um, in, in our sessions and then bringing some of them up to the Board of Commissioners. I don't know that I love the idea of, of making ARPA funds, tying ARPA funds to innovative solutions. Um, part of the reason why ARPA exists is to help with the struggle that that came with COVID. And a lot of our organizations are really just struggling to, to keep the normal going or to recoup from that. And so while I like the idea in theory, sometimes asking organizations to, to be innovative for the sake of, of funding can also be a huge strain, especially on the smaller ones. Um, and so I wouldn't want to make that like an, a criteria from us um, mm -hmm. on, on these particular funds is just my thoughts on that. That's great. Anybody else have anything on innovative solutions before we move ahead on the agenda? I think I'd like to thank Elizabeth for pulling together the, you know, the elements that we had and for leading the discussion. I think it was very interesting. Um, okay, so we uh, deferred the, the uh, report from the Board of Commissioners until Jason was able to be present. Um, at this point, I think uh, Jason is with us. So Jason, do you have anything you want to offer on report from the Board of Commissioners? Okay, sorry, I'm driving. So I apologize for uh, not muting earlier when I was uh, talking uh, as well. Uh, so Jason Machiesk, I'm participating remotely. I guess I'm in Ann Arbor right now. Um, uh, the, the, there's been a lot of focus not on, on board work over the last month as uh, there's been primary elections. And I think a lot of members have been focused on, on their own situations, but uh, uh, we, uh, tabled uh, most of the ARPA three uh, bucket at our meeting on Wednesday night and deferred that into September uh, for action at that point. Uh, I will say that in terms of the, the aging piece of ARPA money uh, that I'm not aware of a final process that's been decided upon for the way that those dollars are going to be uh, recommended or the process for approval. And um, I think somebody mentioned that Peter might be on. I don't know if Peter has any more information on that. I think that's the whole process for that, I think, is still a little fluid. Um, 
I, you know, I personally would envision um, a, a process where you've got a, a different stakeholders who are, uh, in, you know, involved in, in those recommendations. And I think absolutely that the Commission on Aging, if there are certain areas that you as a body need, believe that need to be funded that, you know, that, that the voice of this, of this particular uh, commission needs to be heard on that. Um, but I, I don't, and I have a meeting with Administrator Dill on Monday, uh, and this is one of the topics I have for him uh, in, in terms of uh, how we're going to go through this process and award these funds. But uh, I don't know if Peter is on, if you've got any maybe updated information that I don't have. Uh, not particularly. I will say with uh, the entire range of ARPA investments, um, they, they have varied. And when they come to the board, are they ready to go? Or is it an obligation that, that is then operationalized? Because um, uh, I know folks are sometimes afraid of putting the car before the horse. Um, so in this case, it, it seems like uh, once passed and we know the exact dollar amount and the exact structure of what that, uh, that funding bucket looks like based on the resolution that is passed, that is when those decisions would be made about, okay, we know what form it is now, we know how much it is, let's develop that framework now. So I think that's the current strategy. Yeah. And Peter or Jason, is there a uh, plan to involve someone from the Commission on Aging in the process of making decisions about how the funds are going to be expended? So that's been my input so far is that there needs to be the Commission on Aging's voice in that process. Um, but again, as Peter just kind of alluded to, nothing's been finalized yet. And I think until we actually have final votes on second reading of, of this third bucket of money, um, everything is kind of fluid, so it's still up in the air to determine how we're going to do things. There was, you know, the example of the, the new human services partnership where there was some uh, opportunity for engagement and input uh, into a proposal that um, uh, went through a, a process of vetting. You know, there were organizations that put in proposals. Uh, they were vetted and reviewed and ultimately a recommendation was made uh, and then the county commission made the final decision. I don't know that the, the, scene, the older adult bucket uh, will follow that exact process because I think it can be improved upon, but I do envision that there will be proposals and that there will be recommendations uh, and review by stakeholders. And, the, and again, the commission on aging, as far as I'm concerned, needs to be a part of that process. Okay, I see Elizabeth and then Bennett. Okay, no, not me, more. sorry. Two points, two questions for you, Jason, and Peter, if he wants to chime in. One, since the final vote on the, the resolution about the ARPA funding for seniors is upcoming, would it be helpful for our commission to do a, a formal letter or communication supporting that resolution, just so we're on the record that we support it. And my second question is, would it be appropriate or helpful to have a formal communication from our commission requesting that we participate in uh, some of the reviewing of the proposals. And I'm wondering what your thoughts, Jason and Peter, are on that. I'm, as far as I'm concerned, that would be, you know, fine with me. I don't, I don't know that, well, I feel pretty confident that the money is gonna be included in this, this third ARPA bucket. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, a formal declaration of, of support for that. And um, I don't know if you wanna frame it as a request or an offer of, of involvement in the process. Um, I think that can all be done in, in one kind yeah. of motion or resolution. Um, I feel it would be appropriate. I, I would have no issue with that at all. So I think it can all be done in one, one movement though. I like your word of offer. That's a
So does that mean we're gonna do some sort of resolution? I'm not really certain where we are here. Um, I guess a motion might be uh, appropriate. Do you think, Marta, if I would? If we're gonna have a resolution, we have to have a motion, yes. Okay, I move that the uh, Commission on Aging support the county boards, uh, oh, how should I phrase it? Um, resolution to um, allocate $4 million of ARPA funding for uh, senior programs and services. And that the Commission on Aging offer the involvement, our involvement in helping screen proposals and make recommendations for allocations. I will second that motion. Is that the whole motion, Elizabeth? Are you all, all set? I, that sounded pretty good to me. It looks it sounded good like to you. We're wording it as I hope did. somebody got the wording down because I was talking already. Oh, great. You know, I, I don't know how you can do that. It sounded, by the time you got finished, like something you had prepared in advance, but I could see you formulating good. it as you went. So I'm impressed. <laughs> Does anybody have any discussion on this motion? Okay, then Stephanie, would you call the roll? Could, wait, oh, wait um, I'm sorry, I was muted, but could we read it uh, one good. more time? Yeah, Stephanie, would you read it back? Make sure we got it correct. Yeah. Yep, I can read it. So, um, moves that the Commission on Aging support the county board's resolution to allocate 4 million of ARPA funding for senior programs and services, and that the COA offer their involvement in helping screen proposals and make recommendations for allocations. Is that the motion, Elizabeth? Sounds good to me. Okay, then. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. sure. Could we somehow insert ARPA into that language somewhere, maybe $4 million in ARPA money, just to make it more specific to the particular pot? Elizabeth, is that acceptable to you? Perfect. Marie? Yep. Okay, Stephanie, where are you going to put this? I had it in there. So the county board's resolution to allocate $4 million of ARPA funding for senior programs and services. Okay, perfect. Any other thoughts before we vote? Okay, seeing none, Stephanie, I guess you get to call the roll. Yep. So Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Gress? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Steve Stein? Yes. Bennett Stark? Yes. Margaret Reynolds? Yes. And Jason Masachewski? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Excellent. Okay, Jason, anything else or anybody else have anything for Jason? Oh, I know, I have one thing. Uh, now that I asked that question, I have one thing I've been trying to remember. Jason, can you give us an update on um, the situation in terms of filling the empty slot that have, was vacated by Gary Muntz on the Commission on Aging. And also, uh, if you know of any plans to replace Commissioner Weber, whose resignation we'll be accepting shortly here. Uh, yeah, so I'm not aware of a plan for um, Ms. Weber's spot. Uh, I have been talking with a couple of people uh, about potentially applying for the District 1 um, seat on COA. I uh, haven't yet got somebody fully committed to that yet, but uh, uh, continuing to work through. It's taken, uh, unfortunately, a lot longer than I hoped, but uh, I hope to have have something in the very near future for somebody to submit a name to the county board for approval. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I've forgotten the district that Bonnie represents. What number is that? Does anybody happen to know? Marie? Five or four, sorry. Four, four. four. Yeah. Okay. 
So Jason, would you communicate with the commissioner for district four to make sure they're aware that they need have a um, something to do there? Yeah, um, Peter, is this district four, is that Caroline or? Yes. Yeah, Caroline, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I will definitely get with Caroline to make sure she's aware that there is a vacancy if she, if she is not already. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, now anything else, uh, Peter? If I could, just related to that, um, y'all all still have approximately a quarter of your full term left, so I'm not trying to jump ahead too much, but um, just letting you know, we're entering fall of this year, which uh, means that uh, we'll be doing some communications about uh, <coughs> application process for uh, reappointment or new appointments. So just wanted to put that bug in your ear since this is the first time this group will be going through that, that you'll likely get um, some information on that in, in the coming months. It might not end up being until late September, early October, uh, but just wanted to put that on your radar. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's hard to believe that we're three quarters of the way through what seemed like a really long time. And now looking back, seems like a very short time. Um, okay, anything else for Jason before we move ahead? I, I don't have anything else, nothing new on the millage at this point. So I, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is report for the from the chair and, oh, Mark, Elizabeth, did you have something? Just to pick up on what Marie asked, maybe now's the time where we can get input from Peter about how many people on subcommittees uh, we're allowed to have without being in violation of uh, the Open Meetings Act. I do not know. Uh, <laughs> I will check. Um, yes, I, I will check. Well, if quorum is five, I would think that four would be the max. Right, and I know that sometimes, well, quorum, yeah, with quorum being five, four is the max for this. Uh, sometimes quorum applies, like vacancy, sometimes vacancies apply to quorum, sometimes they don't. So I want to double and triple check to make sure I'm not misstating. so. Okay, good, good. Thank you for checking. Peter, you don't say I don't know very often. Good to hear. <laughs> okay, great. So I don't really have anything um, on the report from the chair. So we'll just go right past that. The next item of business is to accept the resignation of Commissioner Weber. Um, she's moved out of the county. So this is really sad because I think she's been an excellent participant. So does anybody have a motion? <clears throat> I'll make that motion. Second. If I could offer a friendly amendment, could you add with regret. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yep. Can I, can I also make a recommendation that we write a letter from the other commissioner on aging, uh, thanking her for her service. Uh, she was definitely a major, major um, advocate for the opera funds and spent a lot of time working on yeah. it. And I think we owe all of us owe us, um, a lot of gratitude for Bonnie. So. Um, I'd be glad to do a first draft if that would be helpful. That would be great. Okay. You can submit it um, to maybe to the officers and then yep. we'll look and then we'll put it on the next commission agenda. So to you and to Marie. Yes. Okay. I will do that. Okay. Margaret, was the with regret acceptable to you as an addendum to the addition to the motion? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, Stephanie? Okay, we have uh, Margo Larson. Yes. Marie Gress. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson. Yes. Steve Stein. Yes. Bennett Stark. Yes. Margaret Reynolds. Yes. And Jason Masachewski. Yes. And motion passes. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is appointment of a new secretary, um, which is, I can't imagine anyone that's gonna be able to do better than Bonnie, but is there anyone who wants to take a shot at it? <laughs> Elizabeth, are you volunteering? 
I I will again with the exception <laughs> that nobody will be able to replace Bonnie, but we need a secretary, so I'm willing to try my best. Okay, is there any other one? If not, I think a motion would be in order. So move. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Just want to say I think Bonnie, that that Elizabeth will do a great job, and thankful that she has stepped up. To, to, uh, Me too. And I could see everyone else looking around nervously, worrying that there was a draft. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, have the roll call, Stephanie. <clears throat> and oh, I should clarify, this is for from now until the end of December when everyone on this commission's term ends and then we have the opportunity to be reappointed. So this term would run until the end of, of December of this year. Okay, Stephanie. Marta Larson. Yes. Marie Grass. Yes. Eliza Thompson. Yes. Steve Stein. Yes. Bennett Stark. Yes. Margaret Reynolds. Yes. And Jason Maschewski. Yes. And the motion passes. I think I would like to comment that <clears throat> the next officers meeting will be looking at the meeting schedule. Um, to determine whether uh, we might want to consider recommending to cut back on the number of meetings. We had set two meetings a month for the rest of the year, and one of those meetings was reserved for reviewing ARPA proposals. Since we're not going to be doing that anymore, it may be that we can cut down on the number of meetings, but we'll have a look at it and have a recommendation at the next meeting. Uh, Stephen, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, just, um, you know, with the fact that, if I understand correctly, there are now two openings, is that yes. right? In um, and so this is really to Jason and Peter, um, and then and then to the group is I'd want to make a motion that we um, recommend to the board of commissioners that they consider the lack of diversity in our um, commission on aging group, and that they consider that as part of their criteria in the selection process for the open two positions. Second. I wonder if I can make a suggestion that instead of saying lack of diversity, that you just encourage them to consider diversity in their appointment. I'm good with that. Absolutely. So could, we, could we amend your motion? And I don't know how to do that exactly, but. Maybe you... Stephanie. I was just going to say, if you uh, made that suggestion and he said I would be okay with that, all you need is whoever seconded it to uh, allow that to be a friendly amendment. So, and it looks like Margaret's okay with that. Yeah. Yes, but I'm asking what then would be the wording of the motion. That's what I'm asking for. So, Stephanie, did you come up yeah. with a mashup up of <laughs> what's- I'm writing something right. I just have that. Uh, Stein makes the motion that the Board of Commissioners consider diversity when appointing new members to the- uh, COA. Is that acceptable, Stephen? Yes, it is. Margaret? Yes. Okay. Um, Stephanie, would you call the roll? Yep. We have Marta Larson. Yes. Marie Gress. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson. Yes. Steve Stein. Yes. Bennett Stark. Yes. Margaret Reynolds. Yes. And Jason Maschewski. Yes. And motion passes. I would like to encourage any commissioner, board um, member of the Commission on Aging who is aware of someone who would increase the diversity on the Commission on Aging who lives within either of these two districts to reach out to that individual or individuals and encourage them to apply to their county commissioner uh, for consideration. Uh, Marta. Um, yes. Well, I'm speaking out of turn, but do we have three people who are uh, three openings? We have two openings, run, one for District 1 replacing Gary Muntz, and the other one for District 4 replacing Bonnie Weber. Okay. Those are the only two openings we have at this time. Okay, thank you. Bennett? Yeah, well, I certainly approve of the motion, but I must say the term diversity is ambiguous without some clarification of what 
specifically uh, would warrant, let's say, a recommendation to someone we know uh, diversity would constitute? Well, I think, think oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Marta. I think for legal reasons, we need to avoid naming the diversity, but I think everyone on this commission can look at the group of us and try to come up with some ideas as to how to make the group more diverse and act upon that accordingly. Uh, Stephen, did you have something? Oh, no, I, I mean, I, Bennett, I, I heard, I, I'm listening to what you said, and I, I, that is a question, Marta, about what we could or couldn't say, but the idea of putting people of color uh, as opposed to diversity, which is widespread, that that's a reasonable thing if Peter and Jason are comfortable with that. If that's if that is also the intention of the people that voted on it, because I, I would feel comfortable in the change of language. I don't I don't think we can change the motion once it's been you know voted on. I don't think we can do that. I think we're, we'd either have to scrap the motion and start over, which I, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of naming categories of diversity. I think we should. Why, why are you, just had a curiosity, why are you comfortable? Just for, for reasons of, um, for legal reasons. I, I just don't think it's a good idea to go down that road because once you start down that road, you end up getting yourself into fairly deep water pretty quickly. Jason? Say, can I offer a comment? Um, so I will say as one of the nine county commissioners that reading, you know, reading the resolution as it's been passed, I interpret diversity as not only, um, you know, racial background, but uh, sexual orientation, gender. Um, so I have a very broad view of that. Um, so uh, that's how I would in, in interpret the use of that word in the particular motion that we just approved. And so uh, I, and I obviously have heard the sentiment is, uh, from, from this body as well uh, as being the commissioner who has one of the two vacancies. So um, I think I, I understand what you're trying to do here. Yeah, and by the way, I want to say I, I agree with now in retrospect, I'm supportive of leaving it as it is because I think it is true. I don't, you know, again, we don't know about each other, but I think things like, um, you know, um, you know, there's other other populations that may not be represented that would be important that we get their input. So I'm right. supportive of leaving as it. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth and then Bennett. Um, first of all, Stephanie, I know there is a link that identifies the, that has a map of the districts in Washtenaw County. So when we're talking about trying to think of people we know that might live in one of those districts, maybe you could send us out that link so we can open up and go, oh, somebody who lives in this place would be in this district. Yeah, I can find that and then send it and out. And also I would encourage all of us, as Peter said, we're all up for reappointment in uh, January. If you know people who are in different districts, commissioners districts who might be great, now might be the time to start talking to them to approach their county commissioner uh, to see if um, they want to serve, especially with this issue of diversity in mind. And I very much appreciate, Jason, your comments that diversity um, is a broad category that's understood as a member of the LBGTQ plus community. I sometimes feel overlooked myself, so I appreciate. And, and I do think nowadays, thankfully, diversity is generally understood to be uh, pretty un encompassing and so, I think that's a great way to think of it. Okay, Bennett. Well, um, I guess I would like a legal explanation uh, of what diversity would mean. And um, I have gotten in trouble with the commission um, about, I guess, this matter. And we'll leave it at that. 
Okay, well, Jason, can you, uh, or Peter, can you get someone from the county to offer us a legal definition of uh, diversity? Can certainly look into it. Thank you. Okay, anything else on that subject? Okay, I see nothing. So um, the next thing on the agenda is notifying us that our next meeting is August 19th at 8.30 a.m. And um, I believe we have arrived at adjournment and we are re reclaiming a little bit more than a half hour of our time today. So I hope everybody puts that to good use. Um, I will uh, see a motion for adjournment. Hey, can I ask you one question, Mara? Um, I, mean, since I know that everyone's time is really important, but as you know, I've been um, attempting to sort of get the uh, insights that I have in regards to the state of nursing homes in our region. And um, I'm not saying we should do this now because you know I know that um, the offices haven't looked at it, but is it possible that if we in the future meetings do have extra time, that if, if that category gets approved, that I do get 15 minutes so that we can just educate the Commission on Aging on the State of Nursing Homes in Washington County. Well, I so see that on October 7th, we're scheduled to, to discuss congregate housing and I would include nursing homes in that. Oh, category. okay. And I'm, that appears to be your uh, meeting to organize, so. Oh, okay, I, I am so sorry. I did not um, either not remember that or um, so that, that's fine. Great, thank you very much. Jason, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I would suggest maybe as part of that agenda that, um, you know, we, we inquire about the, the long-term care ombudsman uh, from AAA-1B uh, to, to be there and make that presentation. And uh, I think Stephanie might be able to help facilitate that. Yeah. All right, so Stephanie, I'll give you a call and we can, um, let's do that. That's great. I love that. So, and just a reminder that, you know, we'll have to have the materials for that well in advance of that meeting. So um, to the officers. Okay, now I think we really are finished. So now we'll have a, a motion for adjournment. I move we adjourn. Is there support? Second. Marie, you're faster than everybody else. Okay, Bennett, do you have discussion on the adjournment motion? No, no, I'm a, I am not as fast as Marie. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, um, we don't need to, I think we just do a voice vote on this. We don't need a roll call. So all in favor, say aye or raise your thumb. Aye. I see that everyone is voting aye. So we are officially adjourned and I'll see you all at the next meeting. <laughs>